The Indo-Pacific Visions Vodcast is an official product of the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. The program fosters intellectual, international discourse on a wide array of topics associated with the Indo-Pacific region, including international relations, foreign policy, national security, allies and partners, geoeconomics, military history, and more. It envisions an inclusive Indo-Pacific that spans from the west coasts of the Americas to the eastern shores of Africa and from Antarctica to the Arctic and covering much of Asia and all of Oceania. Disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed or implied in this vodcast are those of the authors and should not be construed as carrying the official sanction of the Department of Defense, Department of the Air Force, Air Education and Training Command, Air University, or other agencies or departments of the U.S. government or their international equivalents. This is the Indo-Pacific Visions vodcast. In this episode, Fabio Van Loon interviews Mr. James Cunningham, the team lead for security sector assistance for the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, SIGAR. Mr. Cunningham has led the teams for SIGAR's lessons learned reports, including the recently published one entitled Collapse of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, an assessment of the factors that led to its demise. Mr. Cunningham has been working on Afghan security issues for 16 years, including a decade as an intelligence analyst with the Defense Intelligence Agency. Welcome everyone uh, to our evening podcast here of the Indo-Pacific Visions Vodcast, a uh, production of the U.S. Air Force's Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. I'm joined this evening by Mr. James Cunningham, Supervisory Research Analyst at SIGAR, Special Investigator General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. He is the analyst in charge of setting the factors that contributed to the collapse of the Afghan security forces, uh, which will be the topic of our discussion this evening, along with, of course, the situation in Afghanistan today and a number of other issues that uh, our, read our listeners will surely find interest in. So before we go into the details of, of the moving report, it really was shocking uh, to read some of the findings. Um, what, what, is, what is the, the mission of SIGAR? Um, and, and really, could you just remind our listeners of what SIGAR does? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me on today. So the role of the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction or SIGAR is to do independent oversight of all US reconstruction funding in Afghanistan. And so we were created in 2008 by Congress. Our inspector general is appointed by the president and we oversee any executive branch agency that has any reconstruction funding in Afghanistan. So we have the purview of looking at State Department, Justice Department, the Department of Defense, USAID, anybody who's involved there, we have the purview to look over that. So we're not housed in any one agency like most other inspector generals. And with that large purview, we're able to provide kind of a whole of government assessment uh, of what the U.S. government actually did in Afghanistan uh, related to reconstruction dollars, which we consider to be any funding not used specifically for war fighting. Okay, that's that's a great introduction. Of course, um, Seagar does a lot of work, so there, there's for for our listeners, I uh, really encourage everyone to go on the website and, and get a deep dive understanding of what all of Seagar's all of Seagar's writings um, that have been really really. Uh, impactful in, in this space, uh, especially in the post-Afghanistan foreign policy world that we live in. Um, so discussing the report, of course, I'm referring to the interim report um, published in May 2022. Once again, we're talking about the, the collapse of the Afghan security forces. Mr. Cunningham, what is your take from that report? Obviously, you were the, the researcher leading that effort. What is the biggest lesson learned in terms of the Afghan security forces and the mistakes that were made on the ground. If there is one, of course, there can be many, but what is what is your immediate reaction to that? Yeah, I think it really comes down to the fact that there really was no comprehensive plan. Uh, there was really no one in charge of the mission. No one had exclusive authorities overseeing the mission. It was a NATO coalition, so you had multiple countries involved. It was a whole of government missions. So you had State Department, Justice, Department of Defense involved. So it really wasn't an entity ultimately responsible for its development over 20 years. Uh, and in totality, what happened also is we set up temporary organizations in Afghanistan and we staffed it with advisors that were there for only a year. 
or leaders that were there for only a year. So you you hear this old adage all the time that Afghanistan was 21 year missions or Afghanistan was two, uh, 10 two year strategies. I mean, that really lived and died in Afghanistan with the fact is everybody who came in to Afghanistan decided to do kind of their own plan or what they thought was in the best interest and was only there for a short period of time. So we always had those short-term visions. Um, again, it was just the lack of having somebody in charge, this comprehensive plan. What is it going to take over that 20-year period to do it right? Uh, and how do we balance both the war fighting short-term objectives of beating Al-Qaeda and defeating the Taliban insurgency with the long-term objectives of stability you know, state building, reconstruction, and how do you balance both of those comprehensive objectives to how do we support a security force long term while also enabling them to win that short term fight. So really having that that idea of really what it takes to do this mission properly uh, was really at a deficit. And unfortunately, as many people know, and probably many people are listening to this and many of your readers, this is not the first time the U.S. is engaged in these activities. And so I think if you kind of took Albert Einstein's famous quote that the only mistake you have is lear not learning the lesson that was in front of you or the, from your mistakes or lessons learned, I think really that's the, the key here is that we really didn't understand from the previous state building efforts from Vietnam to Korea to Iraq, what were those core lessons? What did we need to learn as a nation? What authorities and programs do we need to put in place day one to be more successful? Um, really being able to understand this comprehensive approach of how do you do this appropriately um, really was lacking in Afghanistan. That's, yeah, that's exactly what the report um, documents in excruciating detail. I encourage all of our listeners to, to read the report. I will drop a link uh, below so everyone can, can have access to it. And that is very much, very much the... Uh, the case, I think, as well, uh, is just the you know the, the splintering of the effort it seems to be a common issue uh, across a number of different conflicts. So, yeah, that, that that makes a lot of sense how that would be incredibly chaotic and uh, counterproductive at best, uh, disastrous at worst. So, it makes a lot of sense, uh, and it, it is it is shocking how how so many mistakes were made, and, and uh, it's important that we we have these conversations to to ensure that there is a lessons learned process so absolutely recommend everyone give that report a read it is very interesting so following that question i think a lot of us certainly in the foreign policy space here in dc and i think people around the world are thinking well was there ever a way for the us to withdraw from afghanistan in a way that that was wasn't chaotic that that was in some way stable and was some way, uh, you know, um, successful. It seems like it was really haphazard. It was it was very quickly uh, conducted. There were there were a lot of munitions left behind. Uh, it was very much a, a last minute, uh, you know, ditch uh, of, of Afghanistan. What is your take on that? Was there ever a way, given the circumstances that that the United States was in? in September of 2021 um, or August of 2021 that would have supported a more stable withdrawal? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and one that, you know, a lot of us have been pondering as far as how could we have done it better. Um, unfortunately, the decisions to do a non-emergency combat, uh, combatant evacuation or, or any of those type of things, the NEOs for the Marines, um, really require you to kind of admit uh, that there's going to be mass evacuations, that there is kind of a failing that's occurring. And I think that's very hard for our leadership, specifically the civilian and military leadership that's on the ground to recognize we need to plan for worst case scenario. I think a lot of people were holding out hope uh, that the Ghani government was going to be able to at least hold power in Kabul uh, and maybe its immediate environments uh, until it was too late. And then at that point, you don't have the infrastructure in place uh, you know, failure to plan is planning to fail. That old adage really kind of took effect in Afghanistan. And so it was a chaotic environment at the end. Uh, our Marines landed very late. Uh, we're not able to set up uh, an evacuation protocols at the um, airport. But I think it also goes back to the fact that when we first set this agreement for our withdrawal, it was conditions based. 
that the Taliban and the Afghan government were going to engage in some sort of intra-Afghan negotiation, that there was going to be a reduction in violence and, and a lot of this positive progress. And in reality, it turned into quite a bit of frustrations where the Afghan government was not engaging with the Taliban in any positive way. The Taliban were again launching an aggressive military campaign against the Afghan security forces. And so it became a calendar-based withdrawal because the US administration had to make a decision, both Trump and the Biden administrations on this isn't going in the speed in which I ne previously negotiated. So do I stay longer to ensure this or do we continue to do our withdrawal? And so, you know, we had a lot of hope that the conditions that we put into that initial agreement would lead us to a more productive withdrawal. And in reality, the conditions, as I said, turned into a calendar-based withdrawal. And from there, it turned into a very chaotic environment. Uh, and as I said, for us to admit that the government was failing and put in appropriate protocols early on uh, really was a challenge. And President Ghani even told us, please do not put in these visas. Um, it's, it's a signal that my government is collapsing. You know, it's a sign that we're not on the right path. And so how do we balance it? It was a very tough situation. Um, we could have done better, but uh, again, with the decisions that we made and, and our unwillingness to admit the, the security environment was deteriorating as rapidly as it was, um, it really led to a chaotic environment in Kabul. Right. No, that, <laughs> that's everything we've read. Um, that's, that makes a lot of sense. It's, uh, it was very much a, uh, a calendar withdrawal, as you put it. Um, many have argued that it was a you know, political decision that forced forced the United States to, to make that decision. It was uh, both in the Trump years and, and then in the Biden years, a, uh, a campaign promise. So um, only time could tell how that would how that would play out. Very unfortunate how it did. Um, on that note, in the post Ghani Afghanistan, the now Taliban uh, Afghanistan, uh, what, what, is the, what is the state of the resistance? Do you feel that there is, if you can comment on that, and do you feel that there is, there is hope for a return to um, a, a non-Taliban Afghanistan? Yeah, absolutely, that's a, that's a great question. The resistance is, is quite dynamic right now. There's multiple groups, uh, kind of like a 1990s Northern Alliance. You know, can these groups and disparate elements come together to create like a unified force that can actually go against the Taliban? Uh, that's still to be determined. Uh, some of the Afghan security force members that are still in Afghanistan have joined these forces. Um, some that have left, like General Sami Sadat and, and, and others. Uh, recently, the NDS chief, former NDS chief for Afghanistan for their spy service, has just admitted that they are supporting these resistance movements uh, out there. So I think there's a lot of traction. Uh, weapons and equipment that they previously had with the U.S. provided, you know, we do see uh, the resistance having some of those weapons and being able to use those. So we do see lines of soldiers in their uniforms out there in this resistance, but they're still in very small pockets. We haven't seen this momentum yet from a national perspective to be able to generate the type of resistance that can challenge the Taliban. And there's even governments out there like the UK government that came out there and said, we're not gonna continue to support more war. Uh, so, you know, again, we're not wanna take it militarily, we want these political settlements. And so if the resistance starts moving into asymmetrical warfare, if there starts becoming heavy civilian casualties, do they get the popular support that they're so seeking in Afghanistan? Um, or are they doing direct targeting of the Taliban and maybe having a little bit more military power than, than we give them credit for? But right now, it's in the early stages. We have not seen anybody with credible ability to go against the Taliban on large swaths within Afghanistan. Uh, they are pocket attacks, kind of an insurgency kind of based movement at the moment. Uh, but again, they're still trying to get their feet underneath them at the same time that the Taliban is really pushing the international community, especially in the wake of the earthquake that happened. Uh, to recognize them as the legitimate government and recognize them as needing humanitarian aid and support. And, and so you have those competing factors of, you know, can this uh, resistance movement gain traction militarily or, or as a insurgent movement against the Taliban? And then can they get international backing at the size needed to actually create a, a resistance that is capable uh, of potentially overtaking the Taliban? Uh, and right now, while, while there's a lot of positive signs that they're trying to do something to, to counter the, the Taliban, uh, unfortunately, in the way in which the ADSF left bases, they kind of left the Taliban empowered with heavy equipment and a lot of military capabilities. Uh, that's going to make it a lot harder for that resistance to now go against the Taliban 
uh, versus them fighting them in you know August, July, and June, uh, right before the collapse when they were fully equipped and, and had the fortified bases that they needed. So it will be a challenge, uh, but I think right now political support uh, and being able to jar, garner a larger swath of the movement uh, to fight nationwide is, is gonna be two things we need to look at for how well this insurgency or the resistance movement will be against the Taliban. Certainly, no, that, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, of course, that, that leads me to, to ask, um, you know, what President Biden, when he was talking about the about the will, the willpower, right, of the of the um, Afghan National Defense and Security Forces being, you know, necessary for American. That willpower needed to be there for Americans to justify their willingness to remain there. Uh, so that leads me to ask: Do you believe that uh, the the Afghan, you know, National Defense and Security Forces possess the willpower to to fight against the Taliban, or was that? I'm never really supported by the United States. Yeah, so again, I think we looked at the mass evacuations, the surrendering of bases, and we kind of looked at the Afghans and said, well, why are they not fighting? Where, where is that political will? And I think that was what was being questioned uh, at the highest levels of government within the United States. But I think there's a couple things we need to factor. One is the fact that the NDSF lost 30,000 troops in a given year, whether it was to wounded or deceased. I mean, 30,000. We that's 10 times more than we lost in the entire 20 year campaign in Afghanistan. They're losing in a yearly basis. And so we're take, saying that they're not fighting, you know, they are dying on the front lines. And I think the other thing we need to look at is, you know, something I often say is the counterinsurgency strategy was often misguided in its fact that in, it assumed a level of credibility of the security forces before that credibility was created. And what I mean by that is I often tell people, that you have to win the hearts and minds of your security forces before you can expect the security forces to win the hearts and minds of the local population. And so when you have police that were not being paid, soldiers who didn't have food, ammunition not being delivered, their air support diminishing quite rapidly. So they're be deciding between moving to see soldiers or launching an airstrike. Those are the key decisions they're making on a daily basis, knowing that an airstrike may not be there to support you or that you may not be evacuated if you were killed. Um, you know, all of those things uh, were critically important to, to their morale and to their political will. And so again, I'm not quite sure if a U.S. soldier could stand there without water, food, ammunition, medical support, and really stay in the fight for months at a time. I mean, we have a lot of strong soldiers who would put their lives on the line, and I think the Afghans did too. Uh, but I think it got to a period of time where they did not see the support from their government leadership. They saw corruption impeding their readiness and capabilities to fight. And they kind of just looked around them and said, is this really worth dying for sure. uh, when I cannot even protect myself and I can't even protect my family uh, in this dire need? So I do believe that they had quite a bit of political will to fight, but I do think that their lack of morale based off of the fact that they were not able to garner some of those required needs in the field really altered their calculation. And that is why we saw them leave en masse uh, and start surrendering um, to the Taliban. That's understandable. That's very understandable. Uh, and, and you mentioned, of course, uh, corruption and, and the patronage system in, in Seeger's report. So that leads me to ask, you know, um, discussing all of the, the logistical setbacks that that could create, um, you know, even if, even if Ghani had been a capable leader, um, had you know could could Afghanistan really survive that seems to be the question um and you know in a situ in a, in a culture where not a culture but uh in, a, in in circumstances where corruption and patronage systems seem to to dominate the political landscape it, it seems hard to to envision um, a functioning democratic Afghan state um and therefore the consolidation of, of a non-Taliban regime. It's really about who has the power and who has the money and who has the guns in the situation. It's the Taliban, of course, with, with all of the munitions that were left behind and all of the, you know, the AN, AN, the AN DSF that was, that, that collapsed. Um, so it's, it's hard to, to envision anything different um, to that, or at least to, to calculate the resistance to that. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I now just want to jump for a moment into 
some of the more historical questions that you know surround Afghanistan and, and the situation there on the ground that, and that have surrounded Afghanistan for um, for decades. Uh, and I want to go back to the 1980s and I want to hear your your thoughts on on the Soviet experience there uh, in many ways um, similar I think I think a lot of people would would argue there are some you know, some significant parallels. Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. Um, how do you feel that the experience in Afghanistan, um, you know, has created, has it created a shift in American strategic thinking? Many would say yes. I would argue yes. Um, obviously, in the case of the Soviet Union, it did. It brought down the collapse of the country, of the regime. Afghanistan is not, hasn't destroyed the United States, but it's clearly forcing us to think differently about how we make decisions and then how we go to war. Um, and obviously you've talked about that in some of the other questions that you've answered, but if you could just speak to that for a moment and say, you know, what, what has Afghanistan really taught us? Other than, of course, we need to have a coordinated approach, which is, which is glaringly obvious, but what, what does this mean for American thinking in the Middle East and more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a, that's a great question. And, and it really comes down to, I think, you always hear this never again uh, kind of comment. And, and unfortunately, it is again. Uh, you know, I was in several meetings where they were saying, we're not going to do Afghanistan reconstruction in large scale. We're not going to have to reconstitute a military or police force. Um, and then lo and behold, Ukraine occurred. And what are we doing now? We're enabling a foreign military force to go against an adversary. And we're already talking about planning of doing reconstruction, stabilization, and, and supporting their forces long term. Again, these type of core principles. Now, we have learned some lessons uh, in Ukraine. We're not sending our forces in mass into this conflict. We're not putting our troops on the line. We're enabling them in a more coordinated way. Uh, so I think Afghanistan has taught us, and Iraq against the ISIS campaign has kind of taught us, where you don't have to be on the front lines to enable a partner. We, we are very sensitive about capacity substitution, about creating dependencies in our military by putting our boots on the ground. You know, we're trying to come up with some unique ways of doing these engagement practices where we're not heavily involved uh, in the fighting itself, but we're working by, with, and through our partners in a way in which we can enable them to do so. But I think what we're starting to see, even in places like Ukraine, uh, which again is in the early stages, is it's coalition-based. And so have, have we learned the lessons of how to do this as a coalition? I would argue no. I think NATO still has a lot of lessons that needs to learn about how to properly optimize each country's investment into the mission. Uh, for example, in Afghanistan, we, we wanted all the flags to be outside of NATO headquarters to show political unity, to show political buy-in from the international community. And now what we're doing with Ukraine is if you cared about the Ukraine mission, you need to start sending equipment or, or finances to Ukraine. And if you don't, then you may not support their cause. And so it's still having that kind of flavor of to show support, there needs to be some sort of output. But who is managing that output? Who is looking at Ukraine and saying all of the disparate equipment that we're sending there from the U.S., the Europeans, a variety of different countries, who's managing how that goes in and how are we enabling the Ukrainians to fight? How are we going to make sure that after this conflict is over that the Ukrainians can sustain all of this equipment that's going out there that is being sent in from different countries? Like what coordination element is responsible for doing this to make sure we're optimizing ourselves? That what we're sending over there is not just to show our support, but we're doing it in the most effective and efficient manner. Now, that's something that we did in Afghanistan. I think that's something we're starting to learn is that we're going to be operating as a coalition in these type of environments. It is not going to be a U.S. only type of environment. So we need to really start grasping with that. And I think we also need to understand, again, when the U.S. wants it more than the host nation like we see in Afghanistan, what is what's how do we battle with those those challenges? How do we battle with the fact that we want to hold them accountable? to anti-corruption mechanisms, but when they violate our mechanisms, we have a hard time holding them accountable because if we fail to do so, we may create destabilizing societies. And so how do we balance you know, the fact of we, us wanting it more than them? Um, I think is something that we're discussing in, in the Afghanistan conflicts in, in a variety of other countries. And then you talked about history. You know, if you looked at Russia and what we did, what Russia did in Afghanistan, if you looked at some of our reports, you could actually substitute the United States with Russia. And we made some of the same mistakes. We did not, we substituted their capacity. We created infrastructure that couldn't sustain. 
We created a paramilitary police force, even though that wasn't what was viable in Afghanistan. We did a lot of the same mistakes. And you could substitute those things. You could still substitute a lot of things in Afghanistan for Vietnam, as far as not having the advisors trained, prepared, and deployed in time. And so, again, I think there's a lot of parallels that oftentimes we discount to say we're not going to do it again. We're not going to engage in these type of things again. And that's why these things really become lessons identified and not truly lessons learned because our big lesson learned in, in many people's position is our lesson is not to do it again. In a reality and political context, there is a strong basis for political support when we went into Afghanistan. There was a moral cause why we went in there. 9-11 happened and there was a strong moral reasoning for us to engage. You're seeing the same thing in Ukraine right now, that strong moral reasoning for us to engage. And so that's going to happen in political environments where these countries that need U.S. and international support assistance are going to have that strong moral pull. And it's going to pull us into this environment for us to engage in doing some sort of stabilization. Are we going to learn from those prior actions? I'm not quite sure, but us just discounting is not going to happen again. I think discounts that moral factor that often gets us entwined in these in the very beginning. That's <laughs> very much my own thinking as well. So uh, yeah, I appreciate the very, very complete answers you're giving. Um, as an aside too, I really very appreciate, very much appreciate that. Um, so you talk about, you know, the, the moral pull. And of course, you mentioned briefly before that, the short-term thinking that goes into, um, you know, getting involved in conflicts and uh, stabilization operation, operations. Um, and of course, there, there are a lot of lessons that have been learned, but, you know, it seems that obviously the way that we conduct our foreign policy as a democracy, of course, um, but specifically as a, um, as a Congress driven system, you know, in terms of procurement, of provision, provisionment of funds and, and all of that. Um, when it comes to our own thinking, um, you know, it looks like in, like in Afghanistan, obviously the report talks about how U.S. officials in Afghanistan were beholden to the pressures of Congress um, and, and leadership within their respective agencies. Um, you know, we've seen that in the past. We've seen it in Vietnam, too. Um, is there any way that we can fix this short-term thinking? Um, you know, is it, is it just an uh, indelible feature of American democracy and the way we fight wars? Or do you think there are ways that we can really change that? Obviously, in terms of funding, that, that might be very difficult to sell politically, but are, are there any things that, that we can take from Afghanistan, perhaps on the moral side of things, on uh, the moral pull that, that obviously is, is good for a country to have, um, but, but can be dangerous too? Are there, are there lessons we can learn from that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think some of the lessons we need to learn is, is one is to divest short-term goals from long-term goals. And what I mean by that is often when we engage in these conflicts like Ukraine, it's about equipping them, funding them, financing them, everything else. But as the Special, in Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction has told the press and, and members of Congress, you know, in Ukraine, you're going to see spillage, you're going to see corruption, you're going to see this abuse of our equipment when things start stabilizing. It's just the inherent natures of what happened in countries that are suffering from high levels of instability. And so where's that oversight mechanism? Where's our ability to track where these things are going? Because after this initial phase is over, there's a whole nother phase. And who's planning for that phase? Right now, it's very militarily driven. Afghanistan was the same way. Four-star general in Afghanistan. When we start moving towards this long-term steady state engagement, we're looking towards our ambassadors. We're looking towards the norm traditional people that we have for foreign policy. And that handoff is not, is not even, right? And so how do you go from from doing this short-term mission of winning a conflict, stabilizing an operation to this long-term plan. And what we do a lot of times is we take security cooperation and we throw it under combat operations. We did it in Afghanistan, we're starting to do it in Africa, we've done it in Ukraine, where all of a sudden the combatant commander or the person who's in charge of operations also is in charge of the train of eyes and assist mission. And now you've conflated the two and all of a sudden, the long-term security cooperation mission that we do in multiple countries throughout the world, where we have the steady state posture of our support, now gets intertwined to boots on the ground or intertwined to our engagement in the combat. And so how do we actually plan for the long-term? How do we say our positioning 
in this country long term is going to be a thousand troops providing this type of support to the soldiers, this type of support to the police, this type of humanitarian development, this type of political development. That's our end state. In the meantime, we have these short term objectives and we're going to put resources and programs in to accomplish that. But we still have our long term objective. When you look at Afghanistan, we never had a long term objective. It was always how do we get to the exit? We never really talked about what the exit looked like and what our engagement was going to look like in 2025, 2030, 2035, 2040. It was always, how do we pull our troops out of the ground? And so when we go into these countries, I think we need to understand there are short-term objectives, absolutely, but there needs to be an understanding of how do those short-term objectives fall into this grander scheme of U.S. foreign policy and our long-term engagement in that region. And only from that long-term engagement can we properly understand how we need to set up our ends, ways, and means to accomplish those goals. Because if we continue to let the military and their short-term military objectives own the ends, ways, and means, you're going to have short deployments, you're going to have short programs, you're going to have plans that are only a year long because they're designed to be operational. Right. We never had the bigger picture to look over it. And it really comes down to also democracy. Now, you know, our democracy really does have a challenge in allowing us to do long term support. Every two years, Congress potentially could turn administrations. Every four years, we have a presidential election. And so, how can we put in a 10 year plan? How can we put in a 20 year plan? How can we put in a 30 year plan when that is multiple congressional elections and multiple presidential elections? How can we guarantee stability in our mission? Yes, we always had that ultimate goal of beating back terrorism and the Taliban, but our ways and means of doing so changed every couple of years based on political leadership and political funding that we were receiving. So how do we create that steady state? One example real quick is the UH-60 program. President Obama said, we are going to stay in Afghanistan with a thousand troops indefinitely for security cooperation. And so the UH 60s are going to go into Afghanistan. We're going to go ahead and have it planned out to 2030 for them to be self-sufficient. Before that, they're gonna be highly dependent upon us and I'm willing to make that commitment. But guess what? President Obama was not gonna be president until 2030. And as we saw with the Trump administration and Biden administration, they both made decisions to leave by 2021, nine years prior to our own milestones for creating a self-sufficient Air Force. And then we wonder why the Air Force is inefficient in supporting their troops on the ground nine years before they were supposed to. So how do we ensure that these decisions we're making today that have generational impacts are sustained despite our continuous election cycle changes, congressional cycle changes, and also our political focus um, from recession to COVID to Afghanistan to Iraq? How do we maintain that consistent, persistent vision on a problem uh, despite all of these distractions that I've just mentioned? Those are great questions, uh, questions that uh, uh, us researchers certainly need to be working on and, and understanding and, and talking about. So I appreciate that. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to see how, how that could realistically occur, uh, especially in times of you know, increased political polarization and um, you know, it's short attention spans. A lot of people are, you know, they have busy lives and uh, they uh, of course elect people that also have busy lives and, and the, the timeline just gets drawn out and, uh, and, and there's a lot of information that just doesn't get, doesn't get to, to the right people. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm gonna ask one question uh, before we finish and it's not on the list of um, what I was originally thinking about asking. Um, so if you, if you can't answer, that's totally fine. But I do want to talk a little bit about information sharing. So if we can go back to some of the decision making in Afghanistan, some of the big mistakes that were made, the, the very splintered effort, the, you know, the plethora of agencies and, and, and bureaus that were that were working in Afghanistan earnestly and, and you know, with, with the best intentions, but at the end of the day, and effectively, um, you know, what, what is what is the what are the lessons learned for information sharing and knowledge management, you know, ensuring that information is shared intelligently across the bureaus and across the agencies that turf wars are, are you know, something we can contain. Is there, is there Afghanistan seems to be a perfect example of, of a hot kinetic war being supported by a turf war in many ways. I mean, there's, there's endless uh, amounts of literature on that. So I'm wondering if you have any sort of if we can keep it shorter because we're kind of running out of time 
recommendations from that standpoint? Is there a way to improve knowledge management and information sharing between the agencies and within the agencies? Absolutely. I think first and foremost, it's, it's recognizing you have a problem. Um, a lot of times agencies are singularly focused. You know, I often talk about a pretty bad image, but a, a dog after getting a haircut or whatever else, and they have that cone on their head. That's kind of how we operate in our countries is the State Department people have that kind of State Department cone and they're thinking about their systems, their programs, their responsibilities. DOD has the same things, multiple countries have the same things. There's very few people that try and do what you're talking about, which is sharing that information. They don't know what information is out there that they're missing because they just don't know what's out there to begin with. And there's several times where we'll have conferences and conversations and we bring everybody to the table and you realize just how much value there is and generating that type of synergy of information sharing. And so you have it between civilian side and military side. They don't share a common IT platform. It's ad hoc, it's personality dependent, everything across the board. Then you take it to the international environment and the international community has a different platform. And so when you're there as, as a US, you have the embassy platform on one computer, the DOD platform on another computer, a NATO platform on the other one, and you're trying to populate different ones, but you're really focused on, on really what you have at hand. And so the sharing of that information is, is just not there. And a lot of people are deployed for only a year. So they're just trying to get their job done. There was a tool called the advisor network, which you were supposed to, every time you had an engagement, populate this database with all the engagements you had and all the do outs that were available for it to be widespread. It was within the military community, but at least it would get touched on all the countries. I talked to many advisors on the ground about using that tool and they go, oh, no, IT really wasn't working on the ground. So I used WhatsApp or I used signal app or i did something else i said well how did that information move up the chain to those that are making those senior decisions they said I, I don't know i just had to focus on my job for that day and so all this information is is lost um we were told by by central command that they received all the hard drives from all the units that went to afghanistan and then brought their hard drives home and it never was on a central repository and it, i think right now the repository is not going to be created in centcom until i think it's like 2025 2026 so even tapping into the information is very hard. So how do we recognize that everybody going out there is going to be myopic and focused? They're gonna be focusing on the task at hand with the tools that they have. And if a tool is hard, like the NATO database system is very difficult to program nationwide, they're going to forego it. They're gonna forget about it. It's just too hard for my 12 months. You know, somebody else can work on it. So how do you get these things to be easy to use? How do you make it to where it has wide aperture for the coalition to be involved, for civilians to be involved, for military to be involved and being able to have this knowledge management where everybody can tap into it to really learn from what happened the day before they got there and to share the information that they learned during their tour with the people that came afterwards. Information sharing was probably the single biggest issue that we had. And some of it was just to the point where we had a provincial reconstruction team, a police training team from one country, a police training team from another country and a military unit from another country operating within maybe a five to 10 mile radius. And they were all engaging with the Afghans, same unit and didn't even know about each other. Wow. And so the Afghans were getting five or six different people coming by, didn't know who was gonna come by, giving them five or six different things to do or rules to follow and no one else knew about each other. And some that didn't know about each other would literally go there and undermine the next person and say, don't follow the Germans guidance, follow my guidance because I have money. And so we were not necessarily even sharing information, but we were keeping ourselves so pigeonholed to increase our influence with our, our partners that the more info that we had that our partners didn't have, the more power that I had in my engagement. And so there was also some reasons why we did that, but information sharing needs to be fixed if we're gonna be successful in any of these missions amongst the coalitions and the civ mill leadership. And it starts with an understanding that the mission is bigger than your specific assignment and having people deploy that their focus is not on specific assignment, but optimizing everybody's effort into providing a more comprehensive and fulsome engagement process. That's, yeah, makes a lot of sense. That's certainly uh, certainly a logical way to, uh, to solve the issue or at least mitigate some of the issues that surround it. Um, Mr. Cunningham, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciated this conversation and thank you to all of our listeners who have tuned in uh, to, to listen, to hear about SIGAR's important work. Uh, please do check their interim report out and of course all of their other publications. If you want to know about what happened in Afghanistan uh, and, and the lessons learned that we can all take from, from 20 years of 
of fighting in Afghanistan, uh, you certainly should be reading Seagar's reports. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again, Mr. Cunningham, for your time. And uh, we'll see you again here soon on the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs podcast.